Um, welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Northern Ireland Assembly Public Accounts Committee. We're now in public session. Um, members, we have a quorum, um, and so we'll now begin today's business. Uh, so welcome to today's business uh, meeting. Mobile phones must be set to our plain mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via online streaming on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Agenda item one is apologies in any delegation of votes. Have we any apologies or delegations? None? Okay. And agenda item two then is the minutes of the meeting of the 3rd of February. They're in pages 6 to 18 of your pack. Uh, members of those minutes are in your pack at those pages. Are members content that they're accurate and do you have your permission to sign them? Great. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, declarations of members' interests. Uh, members at each meeting, members are required to register relevant financial and other interests in the member. Register of interests. Today's subject matters include the planning in Northern Ireland, sports sustainability fund, and the Northern Ireland budget process. Any members have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr. Muir. Member of Northern Athletic Club, which is affiliated to Athletics Northern Ireland, who were receipt of money from the sports sustainability fund. Okay. Any others? Um, okay, I, I declared interest. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm just a member of uh, St. Jason's GHC, Kirk Athletic Club. Okay. Um, I declare an interest as Vice President of the Cricket Club, although I don't think we received any money. Um, okay. Then uh, agenda item four is matters arising. Any matters arising from the minutes? No? Great, thank you. Agenda item five then is correspondence. Um, we're delighted this afternoon to be joined by Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General of the Northern Ireland Audit Office, Mr. Collette Kane, who's the Director, and joining us remotely, Mr. Kyle Bingham, Assembly Support Officer. Members, I refer to correspondence dated the 3rd of February 2020 at your um, pages 21 to 25, your pack, which is a response to our letter of the 26th of January requesting more detail on LPS. Uh, address database regarding our inquiry broadband investment in Northern Ireland. The correspondence <coughs> details the pointer life cycle database and how the building status and address status changes at stage. Do members any comments? Okay. Mr Donnelly, have you any comments you wish to make? Uh, no, there's a, a helpful response uh, and gives some insight into how the pointer system works. Um, and uh, demonstrates the importance of keeping the system up to date and the information on it. So all of that can be factored into your draft report on, on broadband. Okay. Okay, members, um, <clears throat> we remain in public session for the next item, evidence uh, which will be received regarding the inquiry into planning in Northern Ireland. Um, just before we do go into uh, that session, can I, can I just point out that this morning uh, the committee launched its 10th report, Closing the Gap uh, on Educational Attainment, um, which was uh, an excellent launch. So we had 16 guests there, myself and Mr Muir attended. The launch was in Belfast Boys Model. Um, and of course, many of the young men were receiving your results today, the first GCSE results since COVID. Um, we were very well received. The report was very well received, and we also had invited along the expert panel who produced the uh, first start um, report and Dr. Purdy and his team. Uh, Dr. Purdy spoke. We were, had the um, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education, the uh, Chief Executive of the Education Authority and there also. So it was a very good event, very well uh, attended by our guests. And um, uh, we said earlier, perhaps a letter to the principal uh, of Boys Model, Ms. Mary Montgomery, would be appropriate. Okay, members, um, are you in agreement that then we bring in um, Ms. Katrina Godfrey, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary, Department of Infrastructure, Ms. Julie Thompson, Deputy Secretary, and Mr. Angus Kerr, the Chief Planner for Northern Ireland, 
Um, can we also bring in by a star leaf, Mr. Stuart Stevenson? <coughs> and Stuart also joined us this morning at Boys Model for Launch. Good afternoon, Stuart. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay, so we're joined by um, Ms. Katrina Godfrey, the Accounting Officer and Permanent Secretary, and the Department of Infrastructure, Ms. Julie Thompson, Deputy Secretary, with responsibility for planning, and uh, Mr. Angus Kerr, the Chief Planner for Northern. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, as you know, we are joined by Mr. Kieran Donnelly, the uh, Auditor General from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, and um, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, the TOA at the Department of Finance. Members, the relevant papers in your pack, the Audit Office Planning in Northern Ireland report, pages 27 to 102. The Northern Ireland Audit Office Restricted Briefing Paper and Potential Questions, pages 103 to 114. Uh, and Witness Biographies, pages 115 to 117. Members, um, can you note then that there in your pack are submissions from Nature's Keeping International uh, at pages 118 to 121. Olga Harper of Northern Ireland Audit Office, uh, on the Northern Ireland Audit Office Report Planning, Northern Ireland pages 122 to 123. Friends of Knock IVA on the Northern Ireland Audit Office Report planning in Northern Ireland pages 124 to 130. Dean Blackwood, pages 22 through 240. Uh, additional information, Nula Crilly, The Gathering, in the, uh, which pages 3 to 21. And then Portiferi of the Trees campaign, which are pages 41 to 42 of your pack. Uh, Ms Godfrey, I'm going to now invite you to make an opening statement and then you and your colleagues can take questions from colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thanks to members for the opportunity to join you this afternoon. I think you've done my introductions for me, so I don't need to reintroduce Julie and, and Angus. Um, and I know you've got a busy programme, so I'll keep my opening remarks as brief as, as I possibly can. Um, but I do want to start by saying that within DFI, we do recognise how important planning is, particularly in protecting our environment and responding to climate change and shaping local communities and, of course, in shaping and developing our economy now more than ever as we move, hopefully, into recovery. I guess we also know more than most just how complex planning issues often are and how challenging they can be to overcome, and, and I know that the um, report from the Audit Office reflects that as well. So we very much welcome the opportunity that the report presents for a discussion on those challenges and opportunities, and also on the improvements that we know we need to make and that we're already in the process of making. As members will be aware, the transfer of the vast majority of planning functions to local government in 2015 represented the biggest change to government here in, in over 40 years. It's fair to say that the period since transfer has been characterised by significant uncertainty. Certainly plenty of challenges for us, three years without ministers, the complexities of the Buick judgment, which members will know still continues to have impacts in relation to planning decisions, and of course a global pandemic, which has brought stresses and strains for all of us involved in delivering public services, unlike certainly I've ever seen in, in my career to date. And all of those um, uh, events have had an impact on how the new two-tier planning system has operated, and they've had a particular impact, I know, on us in central government. But I guess I should also make the point that, on average, around about 12,500 planning applications every single year are smoothly and correctly processed through the planning system, um, and volumes of applications received have been increasing very rapidly, particularly over the last year. So as we move from responding to the pandemic to building our economic recovery, responding to the climate emergency, our planning system we know must continue to play a key role. While some of the work we had planned for 2020 and 2021 has inevitably been disrupted due to COVID, and I'd be the first to admit that, we're very focused on an ambitious agenda for improvement, very focused on playing our part in moving the planning system forward so that it delivers for our environment, uh, our communities and our economy. 
I just wanted to mention that that improvement agenda is very much being shaped by the outcome of our Minister's review of the implementation of the Planning Act, which she announced a couple of weeks ago. Members may be aware that Section 228 of the Act requires such a review. The terms of reference it must follow are also prescribed in regulations, and that review commits us to building on the progress that we have started to make in recent years and to taking further action to address issues we know are of concern, many of which are also reflected in this report, and we're very, very happy to talk about those in more detail as we go through the questioning. I did also want to just clarify the role of the Department, as envisaged by Ministers and as set out in legislation, and that role reflects the very deliberate intention of the Executive, and even if I go back far enough, um, direct rural Ministers before that, if you go back to the genesis of the Review of Public Administration, that deliberate intention to transfer functions to councils and to allow local communities to hold their councils accountable for how they discharge those functions, bringing with it variation to best reflect local needs. But as well as being the planning authority for any regionally significant planning applications, our responsibilities include developing planning policy, particularly regional planning policy, developing associated policy practice and guidance, and of course assisting and supporting councils in developing sound local development plans, another feature of the Audit Office's report. We also have the power to call in any application that has been made to a council, something of course that should only be done very exceptionally, and a range of powers and functions including, for example, the setting of planning fees, another issue mentioned in the report, and the determination of certain types of application where the council itself is the applicant. I know you'll be hearing from council colleagues next week and they'll be able to talk about their role and give you an important perspective. Like us, they face significant challenges in relation to planning, resourcing in an exceptionally tight and increasingly uncertain public expenditure context, and I know members here are very well aware of that. Increasingly complex environmental legislation, the impacts of climate change, and unfortunately the ever-present risks of legal challenge, which do have the effect of making decisions take longer. Those are challenges common to planning systems across these islands. We can talk later, if it's helpful, Chair, about the ongoing engagement we have with councils at multiple levels, but I do want to reassure the committee that we do not discharge our functions in a silo. We put huge store on working collaboratively with councils, and to be fair, so do they with us. We work with them at multiple levels and on multiple aspects of our planning system, while always respecting the two-tier approach set out within the legislation. We also have in place a planning forum which Julie chairs and which brings together all of the key parts of our planning system and again we'd be happy to talk about the, the work it's leading at the moment. And we're very fortunate in having excellent relationships through Angus with chief planners and their teams in England, Scotland, Wales and the South. And our work programme takes a kind of best practice and lessons learned not only here but in those jurisdictions. So in concluding chair in all of this work the reality is that COVID has slowed our pace. Personally, I would like to be much further forward in a number of things than I am, and I know my council chief executive colleagues feel the same. But nevertheless, the recently published and very welcome review of the implementation of the Planning Act has, ex has presented us with an updated work programme, and I can assure the, council, the committee that we will be pursuing it with vigour and to the very best of our abilities. My minister has a very clear agenda for improvement which reflects much of what's in the report that the committee is here to consider today, and I'm certainly determined to deliver those improvements for her. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks, and Julie and Angus and I are very happy to answer your questions. OK, thank you. Did I pick you up correctly? You say the Minister uh, announced the review a few weeks ago. Why was it only announced two weeks ago? The, the review of implementation of the Planning Act. Mm. Um, there was a process that kicked off, Chair. Um, it's prescribed in legislation and it was only completed. And I think some members will know um, that there have been con considerations in other committees, but it was only completed um, just after Christmas and announced by the Minister as soon as she was ready to announce it. Completed. And when did it commence? Um, Angus, in terms of commencement, it's been yeah, a process it's that's been underway for really, quite some time. Early to 2021, the, the regulations were um, made and, and came into play in November 2020. Um, and then the kind of the review you, you kicked off after that. Um, we had a sort of a call for evidence February to April 2021. And um, we, we've been working on the, the um, representations that have come forward 
uh, in that there are 55 hundreds of issues you can imagine um, and we've um, been trying to analyse that uh, liaison with the infrastructure committee and other stakeholders mm -hmm. to come to a conclusion. We're really aiming for the end of the year uh, yeah. and it's, it's slipped slightly. I suppose um, this is a question we'll put to the Toolist representatives when they're in front of us next week but can I ask do you think the um, devolution of planning powers to councils under RPA has actually helped to speed up the system? I think, Chair, for, from our perspective um, as officials, we must work within the policy and legislative parameters set by ministers and, and approved by the Assembly. Um, so my focus, and I know that of the Council Chief Executives, is to try and make the current policy and the current legislation work to the best of, 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 of our abilities. I don't think we get to comment on what's better or worse. I think that's very much a matter for ministers. But um, my focus is on working as collaboratively as I can <coughs> with the councils to make the improvements we know are, need mm. to be made to the planning system. I suppose my question wasn't whether it's better or worse. My question was, has it speeded it up? And my answer to that is, it very much depends. If I look at the department's performance on regionally significant applications, there's no doubt that our performance has been slower, but our performance was slower because for, three, for the guts of three years, we simply weren't able to take decisions. Um, we tried to take decisions, then we had the Buick judgment, and that stymied us. And you will know that that inevitably means that there is a, a slowness of pace. So when I'm looking at the performance in the, the small number of regionally significant applications, there is no doubt that progress over the last number of years has been slowed, but there are reasons why that has happened. Do you think there's a sufficient uh, joint upness in terms of your department and local government? My sense is that we, well, I'll start it the other way. I don't think we ever can be complacent. There is always room for, for us to work in a more joined up way. But actually, we have really good links and relationships at multiple levels with councils. I mentioned that in my opening remarks. So I meet the chief executives very regularly. We have council representatives <coughs> on the planning forum, which Julie chairs. A range of work streams which Angus chairs, including liaison with all of the, the chief planners, and some really ambitious work actually on across um, government bases between ourselves and local government in areas, for example, like at, um, environmental governance. We're actually we're leading the way in these islands in some of the works that we do, the work that we do. So do we work collaboratively? Yes, I think we do. Is there room for improvement? Yes, of course there is. Okay. Perhaps put these questions to Chief Planner, if you don't mind. Um, what is your role in the whole scenario? Um, well, I mean, I'm the Chief Planner and Director of Regional Planning Policy um, Directorate in, in DFI, and um, I have a leadership role, I think, within the planning system. I'm also responsible for the policy, the legislation. I'm responsible for a lot of the kind of collaboration that, that um, Katrina has, has outlined there, that, that mm. cuts across the the system as, as a whole, um, and um, it is certainly um, you know, a challenging brief. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't argue with that, um, but I think um, we are working very, very uh, hard to, to, to collaborate with councils, and that's certainly a priority that, that I see in, in my role. So you mentioned leadership. You have oversight, an oversight role as well, yeah? Well, the department um, has a number of functions and roles within the um, the, the act. Um, you know, to, to touched on by Katrina earlier on in terms of the legislation, the policy, um, calling in planning applications um, on occasion, um, other roles as well, parallel parts of the councils where we can step in and, and, and take over certain things um, where that's required. So there's nothing in the legislation that says we have an oversight role. But I suppose when you look at those different functions together. Um, it, it would um, imply that there is that sort of oversight. Can I ask, does it imply it, or do you have the role? Well, I think it's it's not in, it's not a legislative role, but I think whenever you you look at the the, the range of functions we have together, it would be fair to say that we do have an oversight role. Okay. Sorry. So, because you have an oversight role, do you have an enforcement role? We do have an enforcement role. We don't have the same enforcement powers that councils have. Um, we, we have um, sort of a slightly reduced range of, of enforcement powers, um, but we, we do have those with, within the Act, and we can take enforcement action, as we have done um, since the transfer on a number of different occasions. Fundamentally, though, um, the role of enforcement is primarily with um, the local planning authorities, you know, mm -hmm. which was... Um, 
if, what, the policy decision at that time in terms of transfer. Okay. Both the um, permanent secretary yourself have made reference to the local government and councils and relationships and so on. It, it's our understanding that three councils have fallen below their targets. Three councils out of 11. Is that true? Yeah. Yes, I mean, they're, they're not all councils have met their targets. I think that's that's pretty clear from um, the recent, um, you know, um, performance statistics, and that includes enforcement. So, I mean, in terms of enforcement, we understand again, the Armagh, Banbridge, and Craig Avon is twenty eight percent. Armagh and Uma has nine percent. Um, how are we how are we getting such um, disparities there within those those areas, which is bound to be hugely frustrating for for people who are seeking planning. Uh, and of course, we're not suggesting the planning shouldn't go through the proper processes and so on. Um, I, mean, I suppose the point is, I remember watching a programme a few years ago, as I said to colleagues uh, last week, where a man from Northern Ireland decided he was taking his business to Wales because he just got fed up waiting on the planning. And then we had the situation where Hagen Homes, a local uh, home builder, decided that they, they, they were going to re relocate to the mainland. I mean, how, how on earth can we have a situation like that? And what is being done collectively between your department and, 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 and Solus, and they can answer for themselves next week, but Solus to rectify that situation where an employer is actually up upping sticks and leaving Northern Ireland. I think, Chair, there's a, there's a couple of points there, and, and Angus will have some interesting perspectives on the stories that the, the Chief Planners and other just jurisdictions te, um, tell. But from an enforcement perspective, um, when Angus talks about enforcement, that's enforcement in relation to certain specific applications, Angus. Um, yep. So enforcement is a discretionary activity for local councils. The councils themselves get to decide um, and be accountable for their decisions in terms of how they prioritise enforcement activity within their wider planning focus um, and strategic priorities. So critical to recognise that. And that's the, that's the position as set out in legislation. Mm. So, um, and, the, and this is one of the tensions, actually. You know, if, if the overarching decision was... The delegation of as many planning powers to councils as possible. The balance then, so we have a very clear role in setting regional planning policy within which councils are expected to work um, will be, um, and will have to take into account. But actually that balance of control is a really interesting one. So when is it appropriate, when you've decided to delegate something to councils on the basis that the council is locally accountable um, to its own community and its own electorate, What's the right balance between that council taking its own decisions that it feels are in the best interest of its area and the role of central government? And, and it is fair to say that I think we all, um, you know, we all do struggle from time to time with what's, it appropriate to, um, what's the appropriate balance here when the primary policy objective was delegation to um, the lowest sensible level, which was seen to be the local council. Maybe I can add there. You, you asked about collaboration and, and how, how we do that. And it's on, from the planning forum perspective, that's where we work with um, all government departments. It's not just DFI, so it's all the statutory consultees, um, all the major ones anyway, uh, working with councils around a range of initiatives in order to try and move things on. So we have looked there, for example, at, at best practice principles about getting consultations to be proportionate and um, that we're clear about what's actually happening. Um, we've looked at how to uh, cleanse information on the planning portal. We've looked at guidance. We've looked at online activity and things like that. And that's with the aim, effectively, of both central government and local government um, working together to to. Um, improve performance. We have more to do, um, and Katrina has talked about some of that, um, but at, it's at least a forum in which we can have those conversations and really get to grips with what's uh, needed to be done. Mm. Well, I think, uh, and I'll park my questioning after this, but I think I understand and have grave sympathy in terms of the, the, um, the issue of the three years suspension and, I, uh, and accept the, the issues that you've had around the, the judgments and so on. But I suppose to the Public Accounts Committee, it's our duty and responsibility uh, as elected representatives, and we are charged to ask these questions. So 
not that we're being awkward. We need to see in any report that we take forward that there, that there is, the, uh, in terms of the Northern Ireland public purse, whether it be, be ratepayers' money, which we'll deal with next week, or taxpayers' money, which we're dealing with you guys today, that that value for money is being delivered. And I think you have to accept that when it comes to public confidence in planning in Northern Ireland, it isn't at a very high level. I think that's absolutely fair, Chair. It's the difference between having a reason that we can explain to the committee and making sure that we're, as it were, not making excuses. That's the difference, and that's what the scrutiny, I think, is very important in, in, in teasing out. So when we look at major applications, it was really important for me that I can understand what is the reason for a delay. Is it because we couldn't take a decision? Is it because we struggle with a poor quality application? Is it because sometimes, you know, the system as we designed it is not very effective? A very simple explanation if we get an application in and it's a complex application and it needs, for example, some um, environmental information, that process immediately kicks in and that process under regulations takes a heck of a lot longer than the target we have internally to process our applications. So there's a really interesting debate there around, you know, when are targets useful and actually when are targets... Stick to beat you with? Uh, yeah, when, when actually, you, you know, you, you don't really need that because actually to comply with a target would actually having you, would have you having the wrong sort of processes. Okay, Mr. Muir. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and I just want to thank you all for, for coming here and um, to appreciate the public service you give to this issue because I know it's, um, it's a difficult issue. It's very substantial, and I know the challenges that came around through <coughs> lack of government for three years. So when you did try to make decisions, then you had to be a judgment in relation to that, and also that um, there is different levels of decision making in relation to this. So some of it sits with local government, and some of it sits with yourself. Also, apologies to Katrina. Katrina came to Crawfordsburn Park Run last Saturday. And still hasn't recovered. <laughs> still hasn't recovered. <laughs> I, I give an impression that it was flat, and that's um, not slightly the truth. Uh, so so uh, hopefully you'll recover from that. Um, I think this is an important issue, and as the chairs outlined, that um, there's lots of interest, and it's something I've yeah. got an interest in because it affects um, people and communities. So residents, yeah, it's one of the case issues. So before I joined this place, I was a councillor for Hollywood and Clandyboy, and the top issue is planning. Uh, very high density uh, area, uh, so residential planning applications will attract objections and, and interest. And we have our conservation group within Hollywood, which I'm a member of, and it's a it's a key key matter. Okay, uh, but there is frustrations in terms of really two issues. One is the the turnaround for applications. So I mean, you make an application, how long it takes to get a decision, whether it's yes or no, but it's just the, the, how long it takes for it to be told no or yes. Um, so that comes from primarily from applicants, uh, but also from objectors as well, because they're waiting ages to yep. know what the story is going to be. Also, because there's no third party right of appeal, they're waiting for that judgment to be made. And so there is a frustration that they'll get a letter and they'll say the application has been determined, it's whatever way it is, but there's no comeback in relation really to that unless you're an applicant and you can go to the, the PAC. But the other real issue is, uh, is from objectors, really their ability to feed into the system, their ability to have their voice heard. So when we were setting this up in Ards North Down Council, uh, we agreed as part of the planning committee that people would be allowed to uh, make a deputation before the application was considered. And it really was giving people their last opportunity to have their say in relation to an application. So there's real frustration that they send in their, their objections and then a decision comes out and they don't have any further comeback. So, so that's where we are here now. And I understand that there has been change where officials moved from the Department of Environment to councils. And I know that wasn't easy because people were then going to other councils and that was a significant move in terms of where they were travelling from and all the rest of it. So I think it's important to preface that and it's important to come, come from that perspective. The thing for me is just around the process and time. So we have local applications, major applications and regionally significant applications. And the main one will cause a lot of uh, headlines really is in relation to major applications. Okay? So we all know that the target for that is 30 weeks and that the, uh, the last, it's usually over 50 at the moment we're, we're, we're hitting, the last one was 56.4 weeks, is taken to determine those. Okay? Now I know that they're largely determined by district councils. But there's a real issue, and we all know where the blame largely lies in terms of the delay around, which is statutory consultees coming back in the processing of that. In England, the target's 13 weeks, 
and they achieve that 88% of the time. So my question to yourselves, why? Yeah, um, good question, and, and there's a number of um, factors to it. Statutory consultees are certainly one of them, and I am very conscious of that, not least because I have two of the biggest ones that I have to carry accountability for, so absolutely clear on that. Um, but interestingly, no great correlation between the periods where statutory consultee responses have improved and the overall response times, and I think that points us to you know, a few other things. First and foremost, quality of applications themselves. Um, secondly, um, and interestingly, much more an issue here, and it gets you into that space around the difference between you know, outcomes and targets. So whether it's in councils or even within the department, our tendency will be, if you get an application that looks half decent, to stick with it and to try and work with the applicant um, to make it better. And many other jurisdictions, frankly, would just be sent back and the clock would stop. Um, and I guess that's, again, the difference between, you know, if something looks like with a bit of effort, you could get a good decision, a good application, a good development. Our culture is to tend to stick with it and to work with the applicant and to try and get it into the right shape. Yeah, I, that feels right to me compared to just throwing back an application. But, you know, maybe I'm too soft. Maybe, maybe we should be just sending them back. Um, so you've got quality of applications. Um, you've got statutory consultees. You've got the time it takes to, to process applications. And I guess all of those, then you overlay, if it's, a, if it's any way significant an application, the, the issue of environmental requirements and environmental legislation. And, I have no doubt that the, the risk of legal challenge makes us all exceptionally cautious. Um, but the other thing that you started with, Andrew, to pick up was you know, that sense of how do you engage people more. So you know, we have been looking much more carefully um, at engagement and the sort of planning engagement arrangements. And under the Minister's review of the implementation of the Planning Act, we want to do much more actually on consultation. And that's not just consultation with applicants, that's finding new ways of, of having people involved and letting them get, and resourcing them, I guess, to, to have their say. Absolutely, Katrina. No, I think that is that is a key issue. And I mean, it isn't, a, it isn't straightforward. I mean, you know, because in some ways, you know, the less engagement you have, the faster the process could be. The more engagement you build into the planning process, the slower it can, can be. Um, but we're, we're focusing on, on trying to get that balance right, both actually through the review of the implementation of the Act, as Katrina says, but also the planning engagement partnership, which is another example of where we have sort of taken, I suppose, a leadership role and pulled together many stakeholders, including the councils, together to try and look at how can you better uh, engage, uh, get, get community engagement, the sort of things you were talking about um, in relation to you know, your council area, um, how can you involve them more and more meaningfully in, in that process. So that, that, that's coming to a conclusion now as well, and I think is going to be um, very, very good in terms of actually recommending ways of doing that. Also learning lessons from the pandemic and the digital sort of um, engagement that has taken place, but not exclusively relying on that because that isn't for everybody and, and, and you've got to have that sort of equal um, opportunity for, for, for folk to engage in planning, which is, is crucial. But I mean, I suppose it's a complex picture, uh, you know, as Katrina has, has laid out. It's, it's actually not as simple as saying statutory consultees are the cause of um, delays in the planning system. They're a big cause, they're a big factor, and the work that we're doing through the planning forum that, that Julie chairs is really focusing in on, on that particular issue as firmly as we can to try and get, you know, to, to, to really drill down to, to sorting that out, getting the resources in place for them to be able to do that work, putting um, material on, on, you know, um, on, on, on the internet and online so that we can speed that process up, getting guidance documents out, um, principles of, of consultation and so on, which we have put, put out there, uh, and really trying to, to address that um, as effectively as we can. Yeah, uh, I've got a number of questions, if it's okay, Chair, but so, we'll still come back to the situation, okay? Mm -hmm. So England is 13 weeks, 88% of the time. Northern Ireland, 30 weeks, and it's 56.4 at the most recent situation. Raising significant ones, we all know there's a massive problem there, okay? So in relation to quality of applications, uh, last night I had three pieces of work in front of me, okay? Two were quite substantial, but they were pretty simple, so I prioritised those get those done. The other one was a bit of a dog's dinner, right? So I left that later and I actually didn't do it. So we'll do, try to do it today or try to do it tomorrow. You have planned applications in front of you that come through, which are poor quality applications, but yet they are given the same level of priority than applications which are 
um, good quality applications can help us address the climate crisis that we're facing, deliver economic growth. But there's no sense of prioritisation there because there's no joined upness with statutory consultees to say, see that application, and you just get back and when we get that turned around. The impact of this is having as investors are just turning away from Northern Ireland because there, there's good quality applications coming in, but people here are putting in poor quality applications are clogging the system up. But surely it can be a action taken to, to stop this. And that's been yeah. one of the areas that might be worth yeah. bringing Julie in. Um, the planning forum um, that I set up not long after I moved to the department really is trying to focus in on the role of statutory consultees and actually on how you get the applications most able to stimulate places um, for good through the system. Yeah. So we, we started with... Um, I guess shining a light on performance. So it's not that long ago that we started actually publishing the information on statutory consultees. So there is actually a greater understanding of what actually is going on. Katrina was right to draw the, the distinction between the, the overall performance, if you like, and the statutory consultees, because in, in 2021, um, the performance in statutory consultees had improved by 7% but yet the overall uh, performance for majors went the other direction. So now 2021 obviously impacted by the pandemic and lots and lots of other factors at play. Um, but, you know, it, it's one element of, of the system. I think on the poor quality uh, applications, that's where the likes of the validation checklists come in. Um, and that is, is an agenda that we're absolutely pushing forward with and would want to take forward, obviously, through into the next mandate to get those legislated for and actually make sure that that becomes then part of the system. It's going to take um, not only that legislative process to work through, but also, obviously, them working with um, developers and agents. It's not something you just throw out in the system and let everybody just suffer the consequences, so to speak. We need to work with people and actually get engagement around that. But we would be confident that we do that, that that will actually put the, 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 the per quality application piece, if you like, in a slightly different place or hopefully in a significantly different place. Um, and that's one of the main issues that we're looking at. Um, along with things like um, increasing consultation numbers, for example, we know that whilst applications are you know, there or thereabouts, there's a slight uptick on those, but the numbers of consultations are definitely rising, particularly in the last year, as Katrina says. So how do we, how do we, how do we understand that consultations are necessary, that they're proportionate and that they're doing the right thing um, and that we're not over consulting on things, consult where we need to, but not over consult. So that's another angle, if you like, that we're trying to understand at a, at a system level what actually needs to happen. Um, and we've deliberately kept the planning forum at that system level so that we're getting the interaction right across uh, both central and local government um, and that they, everybody knows, so it's, it's not um, push the ball to somebody else and say it's their problem. Um, that, that's not the answer. It has to be a collective issue in which we need to work on together. It's I think, sorry, interesting. Wait, I was going to say, if, I don't know who you, you'll have from Solace next week, but certainly Belfast have made yeah. really effective use of the pre-application checklist. Um, are really, we've, we've recommended it to all councils we very have, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not all of them have picked it up, but Belfast is, I think, a bit of a shining light yeah, in no terms doubt. of how it's used, that checklist, and what a difference it has made um, to how it makes sure it has the right starting point in terms of quality applications. I think this is appreciated and I understand the point you're making, but this isn't new. There's a 2019 Irvine report, which with the recommendation in front of me, I consider that strong leadership is required to bring key players together to drive continuous improvement. The headline conclusion therefore relates to the consideration of the establishment of a cross-department planning forum of senior leaders to take ownership of the conclusions of the areas of future work identified in this paper. So we've got that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sitting here in 2022, same problems. Okay, audit office report comes out. Okay, it isn't good. It doesn't isn't glowing for yourselves nor for district councils. It's poor. Okay, but yet the 2011 planning review, of which the consultation closed in I understand April of last year, so it took months for the findings to come out. And you know, reading through it, it's littered with the department is not persuaded. There's significant stakeholders responded to that. And there was recommendations from even pads under statutory footing. The department's not persuaded. Deem consent for statutory consultees delays. The department's not persuaded. Statutory time frame to determine applications. The department's not persuaded. Processing agreements. The department's not persuaded. 
you know, so how can we leave this inquiry understanding that there is a roadmap for achieving the targets that you have set out as a department if after the publication of this audit office report we have the 2011 planning review, which is littered with the department is not persuaded. Can, but, can I, but, so I was going to start on the, on the John Irving report okay. and just start with that yes. and then obviously hand over to yourself, Angus. So on the John Irving report, you're right, it's 2019 and that, that was the gestation of the planning forum of which we've, we've already talked. Um, and out of the actions um, within that report, so 30 actions, which we've built up on, um, 19 of those have been actioned to date and we're working through the remainder during the currency of 2022. And that's been in the currency the, uh, during the pandemic. I think we managed about two meetings in person before it, it, it became an issue. And obviously then we had to go to virtual on it. Um, but we are making substantive progress there. More to be done, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's uh, I guess, not, not just to be, haven't confined ourselves just to the John Irving report. We've basically added on where we see other issues need to be brought forward. We've done that. So we're making, as I said, sort of nearly two thirds of the way through that agenda and would like to, to move that forward through into, into 2022 um, as we work through with the forum. Um, if Angus maybe can pick up on the review of the implementation of the Act. Yeah, so it's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, there was a heck of a lot of work involved in that, in that review. It did take time to, to, to go through it in, in detail, um, you know, 55 representations. And as you can get in the sense today, there's an awful lot of issues were, were raised, hundreds of issues were, were raised. So, so trying to categorise them, them and deal with them was, was a challenge and it did take us time. Um, and we wanted to engage as well. Um, we, we had sessions with councils around this and, and so on to try and get that sort of um, consensus, if you like, around where, where we are with it. I mean, there are 16 key um, recommendations, positive recommendations about what we're going to do to make the, the changes that we need to make to address the problems we're talking about today. Those are the things that we felt were the most important to focus our energy on, the things like the validation checklist um, and, and so on. Some of the, the, the things that you've mentioned there, for example, the process agreements, the pads on statutory footing and all of those, those are actually adding further um, bureau bureaucratic sort of layers to the, to the system. And, and, and you know, in many ways, those are the reasons that we were saying they're not really something that we're persuaded about. The other thing I would say is that as a result of this, we are now bringing forward a new bill um, in, in the next mandate because some of the changes of the 16 areas that we looked at will require that. There's going to be change to fee regulations. There's going to be change to the general development procedures order, change to development management regulations. There's a huge raft of changes there through that legislation. And there is an opportunity through that process as well to look at some of these things again. Um, uh, you know, because whenever you're bringing that sort of thing through, you, you, you know, you can. So sometimes we say we're not persuaded at the moment, but we're looking at it and, and we're still um, interested in the, in, the, in the area. But, I mean, you know, the focus is to try and get the best, you know, value from what it is that we can do uh, in some of that legislative change going forward. And there's a lot of thought and, and deliberation, which maybe you can go into in terms of some of those key key areas that we, that we look at in the report, by all means. Um, but we've tried to focus on um, addressing the problems that we're, 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 we're facing today, really, about the length of time it's taken to get applications out. And the ones that, uh, in our assessment would make the biggest difference exactly. in, the, in the sort of areas exactly. that come up in the review and, and are, are also reflected in, in mm. the report. So it's, yeah. not, it's not closing minds to things, it's actually trying to prioritise, you know, whether it's consultation arrangements, quality of planning applications, use of technology, really overhauling um, some aspects of statutory consultation process, planning fees. Those are the ones that the evidence tells us would make the biggest difference in the shortest term. Yeah. I'm conscious that people want to come in, but the issue for me here is that the plan system does require leadership and needs to drive change. And I don't see leadership. Okay, I'm being honest about this. I don't see someone driving transformational change in our planning system. And the 2011 review and the findings from that don't match the sort of report. Deaf to the issues, not listening. Uh, we have a planning forum where the what you would describe as the, uh, the applicants and also representatives from objectors, they're not represented on that. The Minister for Finance recently changed the procurement board and made it much more responsive and listening. I have a depart I, I feel and I see in terms of the applications department that it is not uh, cognizant of the issues, of the real delays in relation to the statutory consultees, for example. Two worst offenders are in your own department. Okay. Certainly one of them is, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So they're there. Um, so the part to address that is within the department. The fees issue. One of the simplest ways that they could, could be addressed in relation to that would be to increase the fees and to give some of that revenue to the statutory consultees to get a response. But there's no, there's no 
progress in relation to that. So we're going to we're going to complete this inquiry. We're going to publish it, and I'm not left with any understanding the department's going to turn this around. And like I'm speaking to applicants, trying to even speak to a planning officer within the department is extremely difficult. And that that so that's the customer experience is poor. It's really, really poor. And I could talk about individual applications, but I'm not going to do that. But it's really, really poor. So it, we need to have an understanding where, where who's going to show the leadership, who's going to drive the change in relation to this. And there's not an acknowledgement of this report. And there's so many other issues about local development plans. And obviously that's an issue for, for district councils, but the department has a role in relation to that. The time they're published, they're going to be out of date. I think over six years into that, the councils have put a significant amount of resources into it. But actually they're becoming increasingly irrelevant now. So, what I want to acknowledge is there a consideration in terms of the planning forum, in terms of the makeup of that, change in that, in order to provide a degree of scrutiny also for the department? That, I mean, that is something I'm really very open to, to looking at, and that's something I will take back. Um, no difficulty with that at all. I'm disappointed if there is a suggestion that people, when for the small number of applications come to us, can't get to talk to people, and if you want to. Yeah. Talk to me afterwards. I will pick that up because that's not our experience. There are times when you're in the process of decision making where it is not always appropriate to have conversations in case it could be misinterpreted as, as lobbying. But for the generality, um, you know, we ought to be, for the applications we process, we certainly ought to be accessible. And if there are instances where that's not the case, you know, do let me know off, off site well, and I will. Well, well I will do, and I'll send another letter to the department about a particular application dealing with that the department is impermeable. It is impossible to get engagement with the department in relation to that. I understand the issues you're talking around, but planning applications need to be resolved in partnership around this. And you know, the, the, the responses from statutory consultee are extremely lengthy, and there's no, from the response from the 2011 review of the 2011 Plan Planning Act, there's no, no hope inside of that being addressed. I don't. I mean, the, 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 the implementation um, of the Act review has a specific focus on statutory consultees, proposes a number of things, proposes some things that I think you know will be very difficult. So you're you're absolutely right about the resourcing. You know, we start to look at things like should there be penalties if you're late. Actually, that exacerbates my resourcing problem when I get into a vicious circle. Um, but we'll have to work our way through yeah. that, and and I couldn't agree more. Okay, I mean, I mean, I can just add to that. I mean. It's disappointing to hear that perspective, in a sense, because I do feel that we're we're doing a huge amount of work. Um, as Katrina has said, the the review of the implementation of the Planning Act is focusing on the Planning Act and what we can do in the Planning Act to change and fix some of these things. We're also doing the the, amount, the work that Julie has referred to in the Planning Forum, which is looking at the other actions that we can take to improve the way, particularly the statutory consultation process works, which has been identified as a key issue, although, as we've said, not the only issue. We're doing the work on, on the Planning Engagement Partnership, um, which is focusing on that key aspect of community engagement. We're also working co collaboratively with the councils to bring forward a whole new IT system to try and bring those sort of digital benefits, if you like, to, to, to the planning system as well. Um, and in a sense, you know, my sense in working in the middle of this is that we are working extremely hard. As Katrina said, we would have been a bit further forward if it hadn't been for, for COVID and, and so on coming when it, when it did. But um, there's a huge agenda of work there, you know, both on the legislative front and on the, the process aspects that we're doing with, uh, with the forum, um, the, the new IT system. Uh, there, there really is a lot going on to try and show that leadership that, that, that I think is so important, and yet at the same time collaborate and give councils the, the, their role in, 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 in the shared responsibility, if you like, for the for the system. We, we they are separate entities. We can't force them to do things. We must work with them um, uh, to, to 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 ensure that that's um, we're all working in that in that way for the benefit of the system. Just one last question about district councils. One council out of <laughs> The eleven decided not to go with the central portal. Right. What's your view on that? And was there not a role for the department to try to? <laughs> uh, our, our view, and, and I'll maybe bring Julian as as the SRO for that scheme. But our view is one of disappointment. Yeah. Um, I think it would be a better system if all twelve planning authorities um, were involved in it. I guess that's the price of you know allowing individual local councils to come to their own decisions. And I know the Mid-Ulster decision 
wasn't a rush decision and it had the full support of, of the council chamber. And I guess we, we worked very hard um, to try and bring them and keep them on board. Um, at, um, at the time of the outline business case, they, they were within that um, and, work, and worked through all the, I guess, the internal bit around the specifications and, and all of that in the setup. Um, when it came, though, to the final decision, uh, and they had flagged that they were they were not fully committed the whole way through, and I think that resonated um, with other councils as well. But it did mean that we were protected, and from a, a contracting point of view, we had an option already in play to go with the eleven rather than the twelve. And what we were keen to do at that stage was to work to understand could we do anything. Um, uh, that would help, uh, I guess, in order to keep everybody on board. Um, they took the decision for their, for their own reasons, reflecting on their own council and what it would mean for them, whereas I think everybody else took the view that it was about the region system. and about how we would be there for users and the user experience across the system and across the region. Um, so at that point, when they made the decision, as, as Katrina says, which was made and supported by their members, um, our aim then was to make sure that the regional system was not um, damaged, if you like, by that, um, and that we had all the uh, ability to move forward with the remainder. And that has happened um, as we obviously move forward. But we were very disappointed uh, with what happened there. And um, it was a decision that effectively we just had to um, deal with and move on and make absolutely sure that there was no knock-on impact then into the main regional system at the same time. It's just I've given the statutory consultation a good knock in here this morning, this afternoon, but they're not going to have to interact with two different systems. And it's something the statutory consultees have, a good run. You I know, know, had a good run. <laughs> have raised with us that particular issue. Absolutely. Can I just ask on that on that point? What was the reasoning? Do they do they feel that by joining your system, that their 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 the processing of, of planning through their council will be slowed down? I think they felt more that they could get a system that would be, from their perspective, better value for money for their council. So it's cost and benefits to their council. Right, so um, nothing to do with... And, well, and time frames as well um, was part of it. Um, but it was looking, I think the simplest way to describe it, it was looking at it from the council-only perspective, as opposed to looking at the wider benefits across the region. OK, Mr Muir, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your um, just before I move to Mr Irwin, can I just ask, um, Permit Secretary, you talked about the planning mm -hmm. forum. Who sits in the planning forum? The planning forum includes um, representatives from the councils, plus all of the government departments yeah. that have a role in the planning service. So we'll be eight, eight statutory consultees, all the main statutory consultees, three councils and four from the department. So it's a, a, a mixture of... of, okay. of all elements there. Given the issues and the fact that you, you, you talked about the, the bill coming forward and the next mandated and the minister's review and so on, so your minister is responsible for planning, the Minister for Communities is responsible for local government, do they ever meet to discuss these issues? They meet in, uh, yes, in a number of forums including um, of course the partnership panel which um, has had quite a focus on planning and in fact the meeting next week has quite a focus on planning and that does uh, allow both ministers to meet together. But more importantly, it allows the ministers to engage with NILGA um, as well, so that there's that discussion across elected representatives, whether you're a minister in the two main departments or whether you're um, a councillor through NILGA. So, yes. Mm -hmm. But do they meet as ministers around these issues outside of those forums? They do, um, and they meet on a number of issues, and sometimes it's, it's, it's very local issues, and sometimes it's, it's big strategic issues. Um, they're, they and we are in, um, working together at the moment on the fallout from um, a particular legal case that has implications for, for councils, and, oh, that, yes. yeah, and, and that requires changes to legislation in the Department for Communities, and I have to say, at ministerial and at senior official level, we're working very well across both departments. Okay, thank you. Mr Irwin. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Mr Muir has covered some of my questions, but in relation to funding uh, this, and the fact that planning service has been underfunded for some time, will this decision be made? 
and to take that on board. Willie, can I ask you to ask that question again? Uh, because you dropped out there as you were asking it a few times. Okay. In, in, relation, in relation to funding and the fact that planning service is underfunded, uh, what is the department doing to address that particular issue? Uh, happy to, to, to take that, Chair. And uh, yes, in terms of um, our main focus in relation to planning fees, um, you'll have seen the um, evidence in the Audit Office report um, around planning fees. But you, I can also add that as part of the, the Minister's review, very clear signal that we intend to, to undertake a general review of planning fees, including to see whether we can build in an automatic uh, annual inflationary uplift and multiple fees for retrospective applications as part of a wider review. So that worked very much in hand. But I also have to be conscious of the fact that you know, decisions to increase fees at this time are very difficult decisions. Um, there was a period where those decisions couldn't be taken by anybody. When we got the um, EFEF Act, I was able to take a decision to increase fees by um, with, a, with an inflationary uplift. Since then, of course, we've been in a period um, of real difficulty for individuals, uh, developers and, and others, and in the Minister's judgment, it wasn't the right time to be starting to, to increase fees. But that commitment to a much wider and more fundamental um, overview of, of planning fees is, is now something that we've put out there and are going to be taking forward. Am I right in saying that fees in Northern Ireland are much lower than other regions of the UK? It's actually interesting. It's quite a mixed picture. Um, and for some types of application, they are lower, and for some types of application, they're higher. OK, well, I know they're very much lower in some circumstances, especially in uh, major developments, I'm told. In, in relation to uh, consultees, and it has been mentioned already, um, I'm aware that it's a big issue. Um, certainly, I, I have one situation where the consultees' own time for response was the 1st of July, and they hadn't responded by the 1st of November. So that, that was four months late. So what are you doing to address that situation? I know you have a planning forum established, uh, but will this address that situation? Can more pressure be put on these consultees to respond in time? Um. Planning form is part of the answer, but it is only part of the answer. And if I come back to the two consultees that I've got direct responsibility for, my main challenge there is 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 a resource challenge, and my second, well, four challenges really, um, resources. But also in common with almost all parts of the civil service, we have really, really struggled with the backlog to filling vacancies, um, and that's having a direct impact on on our performance. So if I look at somewhere like uh, my Rivers Director, which to my absolute embarrassment is, is one of the lowest performing statutory consultees, carrying a high number of vacancies. Um, we're now at the point where a lot of the backlog and recruitment has eased and we're about to have supply and I am very hopeful that that will be in post very, very soon. But I've also had to take the decision um, to increase the number of posts there very significantly. Until I know the outcome of the draft budget, that would probably create a problem for me in some other area, which will leave people not very happy with me because something else will have to suffer. Um, but I cannot let that level of performance continue. Um, I have to shore it up and I have to find somehow or other additional resources to put in. So those are the sort of challenges I think faced right across, <coughs> certainly central government departments at this time. Um, but without addressing them with resources, um, we're not going to make the improvements that we need to make. And can I, could I just, well, I just, just hold on, Mr. Sturman, just hold on. Um, I think the Chief Planner wants to come in there. No, it, was just, it was just actually to reiterate the point that um, through the review of the implementation of the Planning Act, one of the key actions that flows from that is to look at the statutory consultee process, um, the time periods, penalties, all those sorts of issues. So that, that's just another leg of what we're doing. And also whether there is actually too much consultation. So there are areas yeah. where if the policy is clear enough, you ought not to need to consult. Um, but we tend to have, you know, we, we get through councils an awful lot of applications. And I wonder sometimes, is it a bit like they, you know, you throw the application out 
um, to buy somebody else a bit of time and see what you make. You know, have we got that process right in terms of back to the quality of applications, but back actually to is there an actual need to consult or is the position clear enough cut that a planner could and should be able to take the decision? And that, that's why one of the things that came through in terms of the work that was done on the forum was around being clear what you are consulting on. Um, do you need to consult, highlighting what you need to consult on and being very clear about what you're expecting a consultee to reply on as opposed to just putting it out there and expecting them to, to wade through and find with the depth of, of information that's there. So it's absolutely a key focus, but more to be done there. Okay, Mr Evan. Thank you. Uh, I think that in response to that, I think there's a nervousness among some plan planners that if they don't consult, uh, they could end up in trouble. Uh, and the, the, I, I suspect, and I'm of the view, that they do over-consult. In relation to Buick and the, the fact that they've provided decisions were made for some time, what delayed the department in using the time productively to progress a regionally significant applications to the decision stage? Uh, there's little evidence in the report that these applications were being actively managed throughout this time. I can, I mean, clearly the implication of the Buick judgment was that for a significant period the department could not take any decisions. Um, I can assure you that work was continuing and we were very, very clear that work continued at all times so that a planning application would be at the point for decision making as soon as the decision maker was able to take it. And I think some of my evidence for that comes back to the early part of 2019. So. When we did get the um, EFEF Act through, that did allow me to um, take certain decisions. And because work had been done on so many of those planning applications, I was actually able to take a number of, of, of planning decisions. So if you look at things like the um, major office development in the Harbour Estate, the cruise terminal, um, the power station, the transport hub, um, off the top of my head, there were more. Once we had the decision-making powers, we had kept those applications moving forward so that when a decision-maker had the ability to take them, they were taken. But it wasn't, it wasn't always straightforward because actually sometimes what happened was that some of the environmental information would lapse because you didn't have a decision-maker and then you have to start and do it again and you have to complete a process and that certainly contributed to some delays, but I, but I can give an assurance that for those applications, we were able to progress, and as soon as we were able to take the decision, and as soon as I was satisfied that on balance, it was an appropriate decision to take, in the absence of ministers, those decisions were taken. Okay, can I ask one last question in relation uh, the report in the report there's a lot of focus on the report on the decision making process linked to the single dwellings in the countryside. The minister withdrew the advice in the autumn of last year specific to this type of development. Does the department accept that this undermined confidence in the planning system and that the device was poorly conceived? It's the, the I, I'm not sure I would quite be able to agree to the, uh, with, with that assessment, but actually I do think that the report gives some important clues. Um, so if you look at the policy statement on planning in the countryside, it sets out how those sorts of planning applications um, should be approached. It is a concern that um, so many of those applications are either not delegated, Angus, or, or overturned or different decisions reached. Our intention in setting out the planning advice note was in response to queries to provide further clarity on what the existing policy said. We do not believe that the planning advice note added to or changed the policy, but it is very clear that it did create confusion, and I think in those circumstances the only right thing to do was, was to withdraw it. And I don't know, Angus, whether you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's a, that's a, a fair assessment, Katrina, of, of, of what happened. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Irwin, are you satisfied with that answer? Have you another question? Well, it, it's, it's certainly on down. It, I think people took a dim view. I mean, for a minister to make a decision and try to do a base note that you had to withdraw, like it didn't spell good business as far as the minister and the department is concerned. Okay, are you, is that you? That's me. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and can I welcome Katrina and Agnes and Julie. Um, 
just want to go back to the start of it, Can We engage in a process to identify a workforce model before we transfer to local authority. Um, Katrina, do you believe we've got that workforce model wrong in terms of the transfer? I honestly don't know that it is an easy question to answer, and that's not me ducking it, Cahill. Um, I do know that the workforce model was the best workforce model assessed for the time. I don't think any of us would have known at that point really how planning was going to evolve, evolve into something much more complex, much more legally contested. And in, in terms of um, having to respond to climate change and increasingly high standards, rightly so, of environmental governance, um, I don't know that all of that was predicted, whether it should have been predicted. Easy to say with the benefit of hindsight, I suspect. Um, at the time, everybody was absolutely convinced they had the best model available. And from my understanding, that was in both Angus central and local government. Absolutely, it was, there was agreement um, mm -hmm. on it. Um, you know, obviously there had to be in, in order to mm -hmm. progress that. And I suppose um, the, the point in, with it is that um, you know there was a, there was a finite resource in the, in the divisional planning offices, Cal, of the old planning service that they were all transferred across to the new 11 councils and the workforce planning model was a way of doing that as fairly as possible. Um, as well as that, there was, of course, additional some additional resource added, but there, 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 you know, because there was um, only six divisional planning offices at that time, there were 11 councils, so more um, heads of planning were employed at the time. Um, so there was greater resource added, but you know, there, there wasn't that the, there was additional. I appreciate that. I mean, Tom has followed me my whole time in the assembly, so I'm, I'm well over it. But see, in terms of the voluntary exit scheme, what damage did it do? Or did play a major role in it? Because I mean, clearly, as soon as it was transferred over, we knew very quickly that the the local authorities were under resourced. And they asked in that context, I mean, surely we should have known, um, especially the the voluntary exit scheme. Would you like to comment on that? Has it done uh, damage to both um, both local and, and regional planning authorities? I don't know that I, you could use the word damage, and I know the voluntary exit scheme has been um, independently evaluated, including through the Department of Finance, and it was found to have met its objectives. Um, but there is no doubt in my mind um, that we all lost colleagues with significant levels of expertise and experience. Do you mind if I interrupt you? When, when you talk about met its objectives, mm -hmm. is that in terms of finance, not in terms of performance? In terms of finance, yes. It was, remember, it was, a budget res it was a budget response? Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, yes. I, but I, think, I think the point is, uh, Mr Boylan's making it in, in terms of performance, not finance. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Mr Boylan. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the truth of the matter is we... we I remember the whole process with the workforce model. So my point is, Chair, if we took out all of these experienced people, I mean, the voluntary exit scheme allowed for that. So we run that model down. That's the way I look at it. So, I, you know, there's no point in talking about it. I was talking about the delivery model to deliver proper services. But yes, I, I wasn't talking about the financial side, to be honest. Yeah, but I mean, I don't doubt, um, you know, I worked in a different department at the time of voluntary exit and I know exactly the same thing. We, we lost people whose skills we were, you know, we were poor without, um, but it was a budgetary response. It was to drive down costs at a time when budgets were yet again under intense pressure. Um, it's a point I think you've picked up already in the wider review on capability and capacity. Was there enough focus? on skills um, and succession planning, or was there too much focus just on driving costs down? But we certainly, I, I would, you know, I could not disagree with that, Cahill. In every department that I've worked in, we lost colleagues whose skills we were, you know, we were poor with not having. And obviously, Mr. Muir has asked some questions, and you've already answered how you're going to try and address that and the report identifies some of those things. I just want to go on to the local development plan, because, I mean, Local development plans, I think, is a 15-year framework, but if we're going at this rate, it'll take 13 years to complete the local development plans. I mean, how, how can we move that process on? Yeah, I, I think at the outset, it is fair to say that the, the timetable envisaged was for the benefit of hindsight too ambitious. Um, I sometimes wonder whether if we'd set, set a very, very slow timetable, <laughs> whether that might have been criticised too. But I think you can't deny that... Um, 
what we thought was, was possible was too ambitious. Um, where are we now? We've got a seven out of the 11 councils with draft plan strategies. We've won completely through the independent examination pro um, process and the direction to adopt with modifications issued. We've got one currently at um, independent examination and we've got um, one, two, three waiting for PAC dates. Um, so they're all on a trajectory. Some councils have consciously, as I understand it, um, Julie decided that actually because their most recent plans are relatively up to date, they don't feel the same pressure um, and they prefer to work at a slower pace. But the key prize here is that you've got that combination of the community plan and the local development plan for your council area meeting your needs. And that should make things an awful lot easier going forward. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't deny it. Cahill, I, I think you know, the time scale is in business at the start. We're a bit on the and just, just one final question. I mean, in, in relation to Nanakabe or Nakaibi, whatever way people prefer to, to pronounce it, I mean, your, your views on that and how, how you think we got that decision so wrong? Um, I mean, I'm going to be slightly irritated, irritating here um, and say to you that that project is at the moment subject to a legal challenge and I really can't say anything in this context um, because, of, because of that ongoing legal challenge. Uh, I know that's frustrating, but that's my reality. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks. Mr McHugh. I'm a chair of the Fighter Roll for Lake. You're all very welcome. Uh, just again, uh, we would like Cahill there going back uh, nearly to the start in the sense, you know, that um, elected councillors, you know, like their tasks are making decisions in complex planning matters, uh, which requires sort of a certain degree of um, uh, understanding and knowledge uh, and, if anything, uh, training. Now, what level of training is provided to councillors and is it sufficient? Now, and I'm speaking uh, from the basis that in having been a councillor in the day city is demand us to councillor area, I experienced training at that stage whenever this was first mooted. Yeah, um, thanks, Felicia. And we, we, when transfer, uh, at the point of transfer, the the department, it would have been the NDOE, um, did carry out um, quite, a, quite an extensive um, capacity building and, and training programme for elected representatives, looking at an overview of the new planning system, development plans, practical planning, propriety and outcomes. And that was to kick everything off. Since then, we've actually worked very closely with NILGA in developing the ongoing programme of training for elected representatives. And in fact, we've been involved ourselves in helping to deliver some of those training events. Um, and one of the big pieces of work we've done in response to one of the most complex issues that we've, we've dealt with has been our environmental governance work program, um, which also includes actually accredited um, environmental impact assessment training. Um, and that has been focused perhaps slightly more on staff, Angus, than on elected members. But certainly um, we've included environmental governance and elected member training as well. Yep. Uh, and as, as recently as December there, you know, we were helping NILGA deliver a, a further training programme on the, on the development um, plan process. So we've got really good relationships with NILGA, we input to designing the training programme and we input to delivering all the, the training programme. And we've also been sharing some of the experience, particularly around things like environmental governance, governance with Scotland and Wales and, and England and, and the South. And we've been learning from, from some of the programmes that they do, particularly Angus in Scotland. Yeah, no, a, a, absolutely. In fact, I think, um, in, you know, dare I say, we, we've sort of set a kind of a, a, a model for the approach that we've taken um, that uh, is, has been kind of recognised when I talk to the other jurisdictions. Indeed, um, as part of that programme, we've, we've issued guidance on retrospective enforcement for EIA development, which is the first in these islands, and they're, they're sort of in, there's a great interest in that in the other jurisdictions, but, but in particular, as Katrina has said, the sort of the training. Uh, side of things for that area of challenge really within planning um, I think it has really worked effectively as another area of us collaborating um, with, with within the system. 
Uh, yeah, well, I'd like to come back just on that um, uh, comment on enforcement, which I will come back to after I have finished just my line of thought in the southern area. That, you know, you'd think there was training in the likes of it that would be probably would be not the same extent of areas that seems to exist, we'll say, at the present time. And I do know like that uh, there, there are situations that are peculiar to different council areas and so on, but would you accept that there is a large degree of variance? Uh, and what can be done to encourage a more uniform approach while still pref you know, preserving the autonomy of, we'll say, councils? I think in the, even in the audit office reports, I think they should the stats themselves point to a large degree of variance. So, you know, you, you have variance in, in time, um, but you have variance in delegations, so, and you have variances in overturns, uh, and that's very, very easy to see. So, how, how many applications are, are delegated, what's, what percentages are delegated um, and what percentage of applications are overturned. And I think in, the, in that latter category, both very small and very large percentages are, are worthy of, of, of questioning because either could suggest you know, a potential issue. But against that, we have to balance the fact that you're absolutely right, every council area is different. Council areas will, will prioritise and be particularly concerned about certain types of, of, of development. And you know, one of the things that always strikes me is that data doesn't actually ever give you any answers. Data just gives you the questions to ask, um, and the question to ask of, you know, say for example, in in, in your part of the world, in in Fermanagh, Oma, for example, um, not too far away from you, the you know the the level of decision making around single um, single dwellings in the countryside, um, or the delegation rates. Um, in one council compared to another. So there, there are definitely variations. I guess the, the challenge for all of us is if you believe that actually councils, which was the purpose of the legislature, if you believe that councils are the very, very best placed bodies to decide what's in their region's best interest, when is a variation a problem and when is it simply responding to local need? And, and that's, that's, I guess, the killer question. Yeah, um, would you also be concerned maybe that there may be corruption or political interference uh, in some of that decision making. I don't think we have said, and I would probably look to, to Colette as the local government auditor, um, but I, I don't think we have had any evidence and I can assure you that if we did have evidence of anything like that, we would be referencing it straight away. And in fact, when people who write to us and express some concerns, we will send them very quickly to the appropriate authorities to raise those concerns. So I, I wouldn't, I don't know whether, Angus, you want to add to that. But. No, I think that, that's absolutely the case. I mean, there's a, there's a very clear code of conduct for councillors to, to follow, um, and um, you know, they're very much aware of that. That was very much part of the capacity building programme. It's, it's, it's focused on by Nelga in, in the ongoing training for, for planning committee members and the local government commissioner for standards is responsible for dealing with any complaints or issues that, that are raised through that. Yeah, and um, just on the same vein, that, but does the department themselves have anything in place to make sure that there's no corruption within the system? Within the, um, within the department itself, we have very well established whistleblowing policies. Um, by our nature, we deal with very, very small numbers of planning applications, um, the very complex and the generally problematic is probably the, 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 the two main categories, um, and we've very well defined um, wrongdoing and whistleblowing processes in place, um, and if anybody were to express any concerns about my, my officials in my department, they would be immediately referred um, through those processes for investigation, but thank goodness that has not been um, something I've had to deal with in relation to the departmental um, position. In terms of councils, very much a question worth um, posing with council colleagues next week, but as, as Angus says, if anything were to reach the department, and sometimes people do write in and say, I am concerned about decision X, we will always refer them um, to the, um, the, the Commissioner for Standards and Local Government and to the correct processes to raise their concerns. Yes, and again, too, it is particularly within Council that I raise that question. Uh, finally, um, how do you react to, let's say, a comment that I have uh, encountered uh, on numerous occasions when it comes to enforcement? 
planning is toothless. Um, when it comes to enforcement in relation to the, um, the application that the department has, um, we use the, the powers that we have. We have used them. We're on record as using them. We don't thankfully need to use them very often, um, but we have used them and we do use them. When it comes to local councils, as I was explaining earlier, enforcement is a discretionary power, so it is up to the council to decide how much of its resources it wants to put into enforcement versus actually um, supporting and developing planning applications, and, and there, is, um, there is variance there in, in that regard, but that's variance that actually council, councils have been given licence to determine themselves. Well, just the experience I've had on that issue that where uh, enforcement acknowledges that we'll say a particular development should not have taken place, they actually would have sent out a letter confirming this to whoever it was who made the objection, and they've left it at that. But uh, uh, nothing is done about uh, redressing the situation. Yeah, I mean, I... I can only repeat in terms of, of the department and the applications we process, we have um, certainly taken uh, enforcement action where we've considered it important and necessary to do so. Um, individual councils have to be allowed to reach their own decisions. That was the way in which the system was set up and it is an area that councils will determine themselves and it's, it's very difficult for me to give you a definitive answer on that because it will be a decision taken by elected councillors in each council chamber. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Mr Beggs. <coughs> it's a difficult uh, area we all face in Northern Ireland and the Chair referred to the danger of even local investors deciding uh, to take their money elsewhere because of the delays and lack of certainty. The other side of that is, uh, are we able to attract outward in or investment from elsewhere to come in uh, into this? And I, I was talking recently to local uh, mobile phone providers, and they indicated that uh, they have upgraded uh, to G5, some 380 areas in the UK. In Northern Ireland, it's only Belfast, Newton Abbey, Castlereagh and Lisburn. And when I asked why are we getting a low proportion, they indicated it's the additional bureaucracy here, it's the additional costs here, and the delays here. Do you accept our system is failing and we are not attracting inward investment which otherwise would be coming here? I think that the, the issue you realise relates to permitted development rights, and we have actually we reformed have, yeah. very recently yes. the um, planning guidance that should make it a heck of a lot easier for mobile phone providers, Angus. Absolutely. We, we've increased the permitted development rights for that very reason, to allow um, telecommunications companies to be able to yeah. rule out their... Um, um, uh, correct in saying that gets us to where the rest of the UK was in 2016, and they have again moved again, and we have not. So we are five, six years behind. Well, I mean, it's just, it, the technology it does change rather rapidly. I wouldn't say we were that far behind. Um, there may well be other um, measures that we, we, we could do, and it's a constantly evolving process. Sorry, or changes, does it reflect the changes that happened in GB in 2016 or not? Uh, it does, but it also adds some further That's changes true. as well. Yeah, so yeah. some of those changes were delayed for the obvious reasons that we've talked about, um, but the changes went further than which would have been made had we been able to make them Correct. 20, early 2017. Although we could still make further changes, and I am aware that some of the other jurisdictions are, or have, have gone a bit further, and that's something that we're looking at. But you accept even outside of telecoms, there are, there is huge frustration there about frustrations. the delays, uh, and if you're going to commit uh, significant funding, funding towards a major planning application, uh, it's a big financial commitment to do so and potentially you tie up investment which could go elsewhere, so we are losing out. We are, um, I mean, that, that was actually one of the other uh, areas of focus of the, of the planning forum that Julie chairs, and it was that, taking that holistic approach so that you'd have all of the key government players in the room and you could actually look at potential major applications <coughs> with the intention, Julie, of very much trying to make sure that the process applied as, if, you know, as effectively as possible for them. I mean, certainly looking at the performance on the majors, and, and that's the balance between there's the, obviously the majors, the locals, the big volume is in the locals, the small volume is in the majors, but then you've got to think about, well, what is actually in, in the best advantage? Now, 
everybody can potentially have a, a different view of that. An individual council area will have a perspective about it, um, statutory consultees, and they, they do need to work together. So one of the things that came out of the forum is, for example, that Rhodes colleagues are now meeting on a much more regular basis with um, councils. And that's partly about understanding exactly what priorities are in the local area, working through individual applications and getting a focus within them in the right place, you know, getting on and doing the work in order to move these applications on. Can I ask, uh, are the Planning Appeals Commission part of the forum? Because it's usually large, sophisticated applications they end up with a public inquiry and uh, the process then impinged on them as well. So are they part of your forum? <laughs> They're not at the moment, and we have to be really careful there because it's a judicial process. We, we don't want to be um, seen to be interfering with it in any way, but we do have separate lines of communication with the Planning Appeals Commission um, to make sure, and in fact, had quite a bit of engagement with the Planning Appeals Commission over, for example, the work programme associated with local development plans because it was concerned too that it would have to st you know, stagger um, its IEs to make sure that that process ran smoothly. But we do have to be careful, Roy, with the, you know, getting I, I that balance right. That. I fully, I fully yeah. appreciate it. But nevertheless, there might be some bad comments that yeah, might come absolutely. by with them, and there does need to be channels uh, to, 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 to just take to, Just to add to that, I meet the Chief Commissioner quarterly. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Talk about a range of issues. And, and in terms of your engagement with them, I mean, I... I it's been indicated to me on occasions it's taken over four months just for you to pass your files across, having decided it'll be a public inquiry, just to pass the paperwork across. Um, I'm not sure that that rings any bells with me, apart from there is one case at the moment where the volumes are such um, that we have a wee bit of frustration around... You know, our preference would be to be able to transfer electronically. Um, the, you know, the, the concept of um, having to print out and bundle up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of pages um, when an electronic solution might be uh, more simple all round is what we're working through. But that is on one particular application, and that's not what I hear more generally, Angus, um, unless yes. you want to correct me. No, no, uh, that, I think Does the legislation correct. need updated in that area? That's something actually we could well look at. Um, that sense, you know, in this day and age, and with resources, as you well know, um, as they are, I think the more we can make use of technology, the the, the more effective we'll be. Okay. Turn to the local development plans. Then, um, you know, six years—that's an incredible length of time. And I understood we were adopting largely the Scottish model. Uh, is that what their experience was when they adopted their new system, or, or what are we doing wrong? I think there's a number of reasons, as I said at the start. I do think the indicative timescale of 40 months with the benefit of hindsight was, was too ambitious. I think not every council was feeling the need to move quickly. Some of them had good, relatively recent plans to follow. Um, Progress is being cracked through now, and I think once we get the first three or four completely through the process, we'll be in a much better position to evaluate. But in terms of the, the Scottish versus, and, and also the learning from the South, where there are much closer similarities, Angus? Yeah, well, actually, the, the, the new system was based on the Welsh Welsh model, that sort of two-document approach. Um, and, um, I mean, we, we, well, we engage with all the jurisdictions, but we have engaged a lot with, with Wales on the approach that they've taken to managing their local development plan programme. And there are issues there as well. That, you know, it's not that they're... They are, they are large processes, and they're, and they're quite challenging to get out uh, quickly. One of the key issues, I think, for us um, in, in the system is because we have just commenced the new two-tier system, part of the process is to replace all the PPSs in the new plan strategies of the, of the, um, of the plans, and that is taking a little bit longer than would normally take for a plan. If you, when it comes to reviewing the plan, it will be much quicker because that work will have been done. It's an unfortunate sort of um, consequence of the transfer. The, the, the role then of um, the, the department in, in monitoring actual decisions and what's happening on the grounds, uh, sorry, on the ground with, with, with councils, um, you almost indicate oh, what's up to councils to make their decisions. Is that irrespective if they breach uh, what is their current area plans? Um, there are times, obviously, and that's where things like our call-in um, 
powers do come in. So if we are concerned that um, a council may be taking a decision that is in direct conflict with regional policy, or if we're concerned that it's taken a decision without there being good, well-documented planning reasons for that decision, particularly when it's overturning um, the, the recommendation of planning officials, we can and we do um, look at the case for Colin. Um, that case has to be finely balanced. The, the um, policy and guidance on Colin has a very, one of its most fundamental tests is actually the test of, you know, you have to be, and I remember this from having looked at these um, decisions in the absence of ministers, which is why it sticks so clearly in my head. You have to be absolutely satisfied that the council is not the best place to take that decision. And that's quite a high bar, but we do, you know, we do where there are concerns, call in applications if we think they're at variance with regional policy, likely to present risks to the implementation of regional policy or likely to be taken without proper planning grounds. Angus, is that the, the, the first summary? That is that 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 is absolutely right. And there there not only do we have the call in, but there are other checks and balances in the system as well. We have the parallel enforcement powers, we have the parallel powers for revocation discontinuance, we've powers to issue directions and so on, requiring councils to notify us about different applications that we might be worried about or concerned about. So there's a range of checks and balances, if you like, that, that are there that the department can can but if you were sitting in a council chamber, you probably wouldn't necessarily feel that the department was the best place to take that decision. You'd, you'd inevitably feel that your chamber was. Uh, and in, in terms of justifying breaching the area plan, I mean, I, I see a language used um, to, um, to grow the economy, tourism, social and economic benefits as, as a justification. But that type of language could justify just about right. every application. Are you concerned about the vagueness of some of the justifications for breaching uh, the, the recommendation from the planning officer and the current area plan? I think where we see um, a situation where a planning officer is, I mean, it is absolutely fine to overturn the decision of a planning officer. You know, that happens, that's, that's democracy in action. I think the, the thing that would always concern us is if the grounds and the documented evidence were not sufficiently set out. So in areas where we have intervened um, and looked at call-in, sometimes it has been because the record keeping of the council has not pointed clearly enough to the rationale for reaching a different decision. So it's entirely appropriate that you can reach a different decision, but you have to be able to account for it and defend it. And, and those are the areas where we've, we have moved um, to transfer the responsibility for a planning application back into the department. And just, and just to add to that as well, I mean, that is an issue about the, the way councils are recording the decisions they make and the transparency around that that we have raised time and time again. I have it in several of my chief planners' updates. It's an issue that gets talked about at um, the strategic planning group meeting where I meet the heads of planning. The Knox um, judgment, um, which is, is sort of sets out the approach that councils should be taking to doing that job correctly, is, is constantly referenced and talked about. So it's, a, it's an area we are trying to push as hard as we can with the councils. You're saying you're reminding it time and time and time again. Are they still not doing it? I mean, I think practice has improved significantly in that. We, we, we um, I think it was in 2018, um, we, we visited the, the, the planning committees around uh, the region. Uh, we had two visits to each of them to see what practice was, 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 was like. Um, and we, we wrote to the councils after that. Um, saying these are the sorts of things that we, 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 we observed that were going on. Um, again, we referenced in that letter as well about the Knox judgment and, and the proper way of dealing with these sorts of things. So it, I, I think that improvements are, are, are coming in that area, but, but no doubt there's more work to be done. How can you provide us quantitative evidence that they are improving on that? So, you know, have you carried out a survey of proportion of cases where that are uh, adequately documented, where they have overturned uh, yeah, we have, the recommendations? We have the stats on um, overturns. What lies beneath them is, is the real question. So an overturn, as I've said, can be entirely legitimate. Um, they, and of course, some overturns nobody will complain about. You know, because it, it could well be because they, you know, the applicant has got the result that they wanted, whereas the planning <coughs> officer's decision may not have been in, in, in that space. Um, but the audit office um, report identifies, uh, you know, the variation, and I think the variations, um, and as I said before, I think very large, but also 
you know, I think you could ask questions about very small variations as well. You know, is that almost too much compliance and not enough challenge? Um, so, you know, if you, if you look at 20, 2021, the last full year that I have stats for, you know, you're talking about uh, an overturn rate for councils of about 14%. Um, but within that, you'll have seen in the audit office report some of the variations. So, you know, much higher than that. Um, Derry City and Strabane, 36. Um, Mid Ulster, 2.5. So, significant variations. But every, I don't doubt that every one of those decisions will have been taken because councils thought they were taking the best possible decision. Can you provide those updated figures? I'm only looking at the audit office figures. Certainly, to think that a third of uh, professional recommendations are, are being overturned. You know, I, I, I was wondering you know, what's happening there, uh, and is there adequate justification? I, I certainly fully agree with you that uh, there's going to be grey areas, and, and, and where councils are, it is right that they are exercising their judgment. But um, has there been discussions? Why is there so much variation between councils? I mean, are, are they are, are councils themselves not recognising there's issues? Some may have lack of challenge. Mm -hmm. Some clearly um, are ignoring their professional recommendations. Uh, and you know, as Angus said, there there was a recent well, a couple of years ago now, judicial review, which which brought that very much to the fore. And and we have communicated with with councils um, quite extensively. Um, Equally, you know, councils will say, well, you know, what's got it, you know, an average is only an average. What matters is what happens in my council area. Um, you know, just the other day, for example, I saw a letter coming in from council saying, actually, so many of your stats are no use to us because you just keep comparing us to the average, you know, and we're different. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, and I suspect we all, we can all use that argument. So it is tricky. But we do have conversations, and I know I just with the chief planners, you have very extensive conversations around what's going on. You know, are there risks? Are there areas that actually more training is needed on? Because although Nilga and the councils will always have responsibility for their own training, if we see a gap, we will step in and we will encourage them and work with them to develop training. So those conversations have to happen not just with Angus and his chief planners, but actually need to happen within senior levels across the councils too. What has been your assessment of the explanations being documented for overturning professional decisions? Most well, I, I guess the easier way to answer that is where we, you know, any instance where we see the documentation is insufficient, that would be a, a fairly fundamental factor in considering calling yeah. Angus. Absolutely, and, and I mean, there, there have been occasions where we where we have observed that. I mean, I, I can't deny that. Um, I give you an example of a sort of set of words that anybody could use yeah. in anything, you know. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, absolutely. Um, not all practice out there is perfect, um, and that is why we are, you know, talking about this and, and writing about it and trying to push the, the appropriate approach. And that's why we publish the figures as well. We publish yeah. them very openly because it's the conversations so, you know, you might find that actually, you know, if you're the chief executive or the chief planner in a council, you know, you look at your 27 out of your 75 applications that were overturned, but you might be absolutely content, you know, that there's a rational, well-documented case for each one of those, or you might not. T turning now to, to uh, delays for uh, the applications, a lot of it is to do with statutory responses and, and failing to meet the target response times and and uh, in terms of the the major applications uh, rivers which is part of your is. department yeah. is, mm -hmm. is the biggest it failing is. with yeah. only 44 percent within uh, 21 days why is that um and uh, you know while it improved i i'm sorry to say that it has um slipped back again um <clears throat> key reasons and i've alluded to some of them earlier um First of all, we have been carrying too many vacancies for too long, where we've got a vacancy backlog right across the civil service, um, and we've been carrying vacancies, and that has affected performance. And thank goodness, um, we've now just got the main feeder grade finally recruited for, and that will start to change. Um, but that's not the only reason. Complexity is a huge reason. So if you think about um, our understanding of flood risk management, and, and something some of you will have been discussing very recently, and the way in which flood risk has changed as a result of climate change. So the, the complexity um, of applications 
is much, much more stark than it would have been even um, six or seven years ago. The quality of applications we've already touched on. Um, and the one thing I would say, and it is not much comfort, and I absolutely accept it, is that this is the one thing we have not allowed to suffer is the quality of those consultation responses. Because when you're dealing with flood risk, you know, the consequences for individuals and property are just too horrendous. You're, you're but talking about flood risk. You have, you have your flood, flood risk maps yep. updated with climate change. So yep. what more do you have to do than look at the map to see whether you're in an area relevant to the flood risk? Well, you're looking at the map. You're looking at the mitigations in place um, to address flood risk. You're looking at what's planned in terms of um, <coughs> flood risk management. You're looking at whether anything has changed in the science, whether there are any different engineering solutions, whether there are conditions that you could put on an application. Um, and you're making a, a, well, you're making a judgment and you're giving the best information you can to, in most cases, a council. Um, who will then have to weigh up that information with, with, with other pieces of information. So it is complex. The science moves all the time. The understanding moves all the time. But I can't say that the complexity is the only reason because I am absolutely clear, you know, we've been carrying, we've suffered from carrying vacancies that we haven't been able to fill. Northern Ireland Water is also, you're responsible yep. for them as well. Only 51%. What's, what's happening there? Where are they lead? Northern Ireland's water's improvement, our performance has improved very significantly over the last couple of years. Um, the last figures I saw had it close to 97, 98%. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have done what I've just been talking about. They have had to reprioritise and they have had to put more resources in. Um, and thankfully, they're able to recruit directly and are able to do it more quickly than I am. But yeah, they, they have put in a, a quite a significant improvement programme. They're represented um, through the planning forum, Julie. They are and indeed, and, and the, the figure for them for 2021 was 88% was on a global basis, and, and as Katrina says, up into the, the very high 90s on locals. So they, they really have um, done a bit of a step change in there to, to move it on. And, 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 and roads then, only 55% and for major applications are within the 21 days. Uh, have you addressed that one? Um, yeah, uh, roads gets a staggering um, number of planning application uh, consultations every year. One of the issues there that we are having to tackle um, is whether they're being over-consulted. Um, the latest figure is 75% within the statutory, you know, sort of, Time frames that we would very much like to see. Um, again, we have a number of vacancies so there. Can, that can are I just come in there? When you say whether well, they're being overconsulted, is that a culture that they they have created themselves? No. Well, I don't think so. No, I think there is, and uh, um, and I think um, William Irwin report, referenced it earlier in his question. I think there can also be a sentence of, of safeguarding. You know, maybe I'll just stick this out in case there's, you know, in case there's something wrong with it. Um, so I think there is something more that we can do around setting out what are the factors that need to be considered to let planners take the right decision without the need for over consultation. Um, we do struggle with resources. You, you know, some of you will know very well that you know. To put more resources into that area, I will have to take them from another area that many of you will consider will be equally or even more important, and, and that will be the challenge. But again, my main priority there is to fill the eight vacancies that, that we have at present. And roads are very deliberately then working with councils and put in more regular meetings than maybe they would have had in the past just to get underneath um, that and actually make sure that they're doing both sides can see with the purpose of what they're doing and that the consultations are meaningful. And they're also doing a bit more to fast track the low risk applications so that they don't take any longer than, than, than strictly necessary um, and, and trying to encourage you know, improvements to the, 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 mm -hmm. the checklists that we're trying to encourage councils to make more use of. These regular figures that you're talking about, you know, can we have transparency? How often are they published? They're published every quarter. They're, well, they're, they're once they're validated, obviously, through the statistical process, but they're published um, on a quarterly basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. So and the an annual report yeah. produced. Now, there's a bit of a lag time, Roy, obviously, because, you know, they have to collate it and collect it and cleaned and statistically verified and everything else, but they are published quarterly, and we made a point of doing that to try, as Julie said, and, and shine the spotlight, painful though it is on performance because we also know that the more you've, you talk about performance the more you know focus there is then on, on, on improving it. Hawthorne effect isn't it? 
Okay. Shine a spotlight on something and it gets better. I was pointing at you and your department where the cause of a major I mean, of the problem. I, I, it causes me great pain. Um, and one of the things we have done is um, because, well, because I hope we had certainty over a three-year budget period, um, you know, we've I, I've reassessed what it would take to improve performance in relation to staff, and we've included that as an inescapable bid in our draft budget um, proposals. Because unless we can resource this, you know, we will not make the improvements that we need to make. And I am not in a position where I have, unfortunately, lots and lots of resources that I can redeploy because redeploying just creates a a major problem somewhere else. So going back to basics, what would what would a really slick performance look like? How many staff would we need of what level with what qualifications to deliver that performance? And then what are the costs of that? And that's part of our inescapable um, budget bid. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Senator, at the very outset of your evidence, you said that 12,000 permissions were granted smoothly per year. How many aren't? That's a good question, Chair. Um, I was going on the average around 12,500 every year. Mm. Go through the, go it through means the nothing unless we know what the overall yeah. figure is. Yeah. Could, could you perhaps furnish I the committee with that? Certainly could, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the... the um, what would you say to the question that there's a perception out there that uh, there's a lack of accountability and poor performance um, around this issue? Uh, the chief planner made mention earlier on about the, the skills gap, uh, and about you made a comment about the voluntary exit scheme. Has this really rendered the planning service, given that you've mentioned a number of times about vacancies, that it's not fit for purpose at the moment? Uh, no, and there's an important distinction there. So when I talk about vacancies, I talk about the vacancies in those parts of the system, including in my own department that are responsible for, for statutory consultations. So that's not the same thing. I, I'm, we're blessed actually with um, hugely professional, hugely hardworking and hugely skilled planners. I can say that about the, the directorates in my own department and I can also say it about local government. Um, the resource and the vacancy point I specifically made in relation to um, those teams that respond as part of the statutory consultation process. So, so that's that's a different thing in terms of accountability. We are publishing more now than we ever published before. We're publishing, as I've said, there are quarterly figures on performance. We're publishing annual figures on performance, and that's very deliberate um, because. I don't think we will solve all of the issues that we, we have to solve without absolute transparency on, on where performance is good and where it is not good enough. Mm. So in terms of accountab accountability, um, there, is, there is more information than ever going very openly into the public domain. Where the tension is, I think, is where we started from, which is if, if almost all planning decisions are taken in a context where the specific intention was that accountability should be local, then you know how can we work even better collaboratively to make sure that the system as a whole um, delivers for the environment, for local communities, and for our economy? And I think that's the that's that's mm. the critical thing. Given the point that Mr. Beggs made earlier about within your own department, you know the 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 difficulty there is in terms of processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then there's the issue about the lack of skills and the skills gap in local government. The fact that there's a you know not all local government are signed up to the new computerised systems coming in. The fact that they work at different pace and whatever. Given the internal issues within infrastructure and then the the issues that there is in local government, what would you what would you say to the to the assertion that this whole process is being paralysed by silo culture? I don't recognise in the way in which we work, and, and it'll be interesting to hear the local government perspective, I, I, I don't recognise that culture because what I see and what I know we have done is we have taken steps, so we've created the planning for it, we've brought everybody involved in the, in, the, in, in the system together. We work at multiple levels, and Angus has described some of those for you with local government. We work across government um, with the Department for Communities with the NIAA. 
that I don't think is the, the issue. We can always be better. I mean, there is never any room for complacency and collaborative working. The, the, the issues and the challenges we face are, are rather different. So complexity of applications, a litigious culture where legal challenge is high and challenges around having the resources we would need to run and resource mm. a very effective operation. And, and those are the issues as I see them. Those are not caused by you know, us not working collaboratively. They're, they're, they're the reality of the, the world in which we live. Mm. And in terms of the, the, do you think there's a lack of accountability? No, I don't, because I think, as I say, councils are very, you know, the, the decisions taken in councils are automatically accountable. You know, there's an accountability built in by the very nature of local government. Um, I think for, for us in central government, the key tests for us are the applications we process ourselves, um, and you will know that they take, for some of the reasons, they take us much longer than any of us would, would like. Some of those reasons we can deal with through improving processes. Some of them we won't be able to because they are part of a slightly different process. We've got the cultural issue, are we too helpful? You know, should we be harder nosed at sending applications back? I, I'm not sure that's the right answer from an outcomes base, but it would certainly help my stats if, if, mm. if we did that. Um, and in all of that, you know, you, you've got to pick, keep your focus on what are we trying to do here? So, you know, what's the purpose of the planning system? The planning system is about creating really great, vibrant places, protecting our environment, responding to climate change, giving communities places that people can thrive in, and actually, you know, helping to develop and enable our economy. And, and for me, the stats are really important because they give me the questions, but I have to keep coming back to, you know, if you, if you route planning within, if we had one and a great programme for government, it would be an absolutely fundamental enabler. In the overall con context of planning, the department is responsible for a very small number of applications. Responsibility lies elsewhere, obviously local government. Um, how many people have you working in your planning department? We have about um, 80 staff in our, in our two planning, across our two planning directorates, so they fulfil a range of functions. So you've got the regional policy, um, and the work that Angus does, working collaboratively across councils as chief, chief planner, and then we have teams working on local development plans, and we have the teams who case work those small number of, plan, of planning applications that come into us, and, and Julie has the responsibility of being... <laughs> Looking after all of them, so, yeah. so I hope I haven't left anything out. No, I think in terms of the casework side, if you, if you focus, you talked about there, the smaller number of, of applications, we, we would have about nine staff working in that particular area out of the 80. So um, a large portion, actually, of the staff, it, it actually talks to the collaboration point as well, in the sense that a lot of the, the, the people that work on Angus's side are working and engaging across the system on a range of policy areas um, and would spend a lot of their focus either engaging with other uh, local government or with central government departments around policy initiatives. Um, and then we have the side which is the local development plans and the casework. Um, but there's a, there's a raft obviously of, of, so, of work that needs to be done. you have nine out of 80 working on applications? Yes. Is that enough? Well, that's nine professional if you like. We've got a you know, four or five administrators below that as well. Um, so that's 13? Yeah. Yeah. Well, is it enough? I mean, it's certainly what we have put into that place. We have looked at, over time, about moving people around where we need to. Um, and this and obviously gets to what can you do at a point? Have we had ministers in, in place and whatever? Um, the challenges of the pandemic, we've had to move people into taking work through to deal with the pandemic as well so that's your there's a constant i would suggest weighing up of the of the core staff to establish where they can best be, be placed um on an ongoing basis um okay. i mean it gets back i think to the resourcing point generally um that you know if if there was more planners could you do more of course you could but yeah. then that would require more money just before being mr beggs and he's going to be very brief um you mentioned buick and a number of examples of buick um, can I ask, is there any progress in New York Street interchange? Um, it, it, it's, it, the issues with York Street interchange aren't planning issues, Chair. Mm -hmm. 
There are no issues in planning? There are not planning issues at this point. There are issues, and I think the, my minister is on record in terms of her position. So her position is she has undertaken a further review. She's considering that. She's committed to the project, but it's not. I'm very conscious. Um, it's, it's, its issues are not planning issues. They're transport policy issues, um, and therefore... But they're, they're within your department? They are indeed, yes. Right. So the issues aren't planning. They're within your department. Um, is the money ring fence for that? The budget for next year and the next three years hasn't been confirmed yet. Did the confidence in supply money that was secured for it, is it ring fenced? The confidence in supply money that we received, we received for infrastructure projects generally, um, and that process has been followed through. So um, it's. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying actually, to refer actually, back to the report. Sorry, Chair, I'm just yes, trying yes to understand. Yes or no, we do, actually. Report. Is the money ring fenced or not? We haven't got a budget for next year, so I don't so know. So it's not ring fenced? No. Mr. Beggs. There's, no, there's no budget for. There's nothing ring fenced um, until we have a draft. Yeah, but there was a specific a pot of money secured through confidence and supply in York Street. But that was for Jewish. previous years? Correct. Yes. And it's nothing been done, not a single thing done. It's this issue of a large number of poor quality applications, and that's not actually good for the applicant, no, it's not. Nor, nor planners, um, because they don't realise they need to go and do something now as opposed to wait the several months later and then start a process. So, in your, uh, I understand you, you are recommending or uh, commending Belfast City Council for their approach, which has uh, identified that at a very early stage. But this has not been rolled out across all councils. Can you tell us which councils it has been rolled out so that everyone becomes aware where quick improvement could occur? Uh, Belfast certainly has, um, and it's one of the things we're looking to see whether we could actually legislate for for the future, which may or may not be popular to, to make it part of the legislative environment in terms of other councils, Angus. Yeah, I don't think it's actually been fully um, rolled out in, in other councils. There are two or three other councils who are looking at it from the yes. last time of the forum, yes, Julie. Yeah, I think ABC, ABC were very, yeah. very closely looking at it. Um, and, and whether they've actually started it yet or not, but they've certainly um, started the process. As I said earlier, there's a lot of engagement needed with it. You can't just do it uh, and uh, leave developers or agents to, to deal with the consequences. It's about an education process and ensuring people understand what's needed. Um, but ABC they definitely were, were looking at it, but that, um, how far along that journey they've got, uh, Belfast is definitely the furthest ahead on it. Right, so I, I sort of have picked up an impression that several others were picking up that good uh, working practice, but actually nobody, been, yeah. nobody else has implemented it yet. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, we've been, we've been recommending it for quite some time, actually, and we can really see the value of it um, when, you know, when it's picked up, um, but we can't enforce it. Oh, I know. Okay, Mr Muir. It's just, just one issue. Um, there's another one which we'll probably deal with correspondence, which is about the money issue, because uh, I think it's an important issue that came through in the inquiry. But um, and just to reassure yes. you on that, I mean we have engaged very, very extensively with yes. with Dara. Um, we work very well with Dara, um, and as soon as they're in a position to give us what we need, I don't doubt that they'll give us it. Yeah, because I think it's 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 an important issue, and yeah. I think it's important it's not neglected alongside other issues such as enforcement. But um, when I had the opportunity to ask questions, I was raising the issue of the pre-application discussions. Okay, so um, this is the uh, outcome from the review of the 2011 Plan and Act, and it says uh, a broad section of respondents, including some councils, NGOs, business, and representative bodies. So it's applicants and objectors. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, suggested that pads should be moved to legislative fitting, particularly for major and regionally significant development proposals. Uh, with statutory consultees enabled to charge their own pad fees with the income ring fence to improve capacity. Some developers suggested it would be willing to pay statutory consultees for pad device if it could improve the quality of their applications and significantly improve processing time. Some suggested councils could take, uh, can take different approaches to pre-application discussions as this may, uh, and this may benefit from a more standardised formalised approach in subordinate legislation. So the reason I'm raising this, Angus, is because people are asking for this uh, to be put on a statutory footing, not to delay the system, but to improve it. And your response to me was that we could actually delay the system and add more bureaucracy to it. But there's clear practical suggestions being made about putting it on a statutory footing, but the response was the department is not persuaded of the case or benefits from moving pads to a legislative footing. 
Can you understand where the frustration comes from me? The people are making suggestions to yourselves as a department for ways of speeding it up. I get that. Yeah, no, I can understand how that, that com comes across, but the, the reason that we're not persuaded to, to do that is some of the things that we've been talking about here today, because if you, if you put pads on a statutory basis, that means that statutory consultees and planners who are um, under pressure dealing with all of the planning applications are required to undertake that process for a wide range of applications and um, beyond the ones that that you know the, the, the administrative arrangements that are that are in place at the moment um, are, are working for, and actually we we are concerned that um, at this stage, if we were to do that, it would actually get, you know be, be counterproductive, and would actually put further pressure on statutory consultees who at the who at the moment are telling us. We're struggling to be able to undertake the statutory consultation requirements in the planning system, um, and also uh, the the kind of administrative pad processes which we're recommending on an administrative basis for some of the the, the major applications. So it's not saying that this we are 100% bought into pre-application discussions. We we believe that's the, be the the way forward. Added to validation checklists, getting the application right at the start will help, but. We're just not. We're, we're saying we're, we're not convinced that at the moment putting it on a legislative basis would be the right um, would be the right approach. That it actually would end up could end up being counterproductive. But it's something that you know that we we are keeping under review. We we have a it's a stream of work in the planning forum at the moment, um, where there's a workshop coming up um, next month with councils to look at guidance um, for how we can actually use pads as effectively as possible under the current arrangements, which are administrative. People are prepared to pay you his money, okay, for, if they can get quicker decisions and then and not for that to go to the statutory consultees, turn that around and like, you know, this is the thing, applicants, you know, are bought into the consultation process. It's clear here that some, that some of the developers are saying they're happy to pay more if they would actually turn it around. So that, that there's constructive suggestions coming and that's where the frustration comes. I I think you've made your point. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Irwin. You're on mute, Mr. Irwin. No, just to say, um, I deal with planners in my local ABC council on a regular basis, and a number of days a week, I usually be speaking to someone. Uh, and I, I am aware that pure applications by agents are a big issue and I, I think the I know I know for a fact that they're looking at ways of dealing with that in the in their kind in the ABC Council because it it has been an issue and is an issue. Um, I want to ask someone the last question. Is there any other ways of improving confidence in the planning system beyond what is contained in the audit report? I think there's um, a number of ways, and I think the the areas Angus was talking about feed into it. So, you know, getting the right decisions. So, in all of this, actually, the one thing we haven't talked about is the importance of getting the right decision. Um, that inspires confidence. Getting decisions in a timely manner. There's no doubt that that inspires confidence, and we've already talked about you know where that works well and where there are, you know, where there is much improvement. And I guess, you know, those must be, uh, and, and the, absolute, the actual outcomes, and there's a very interesting line in the Audit Office report about actually the discipline of going back and looking at the decisions that you took um, and seeing whether or not what you decided to, you know, in most cases, I guess, what we approve, did it manifest itself um, as you envisaged? Did it create the jobs? Did it protect the environment? Did it enhance the place in the way you thought it did? And I think there is something, therefore, also about that reflection um, and actually going back, looking at decisions and looking at what came from the decisions and that must be a key part of building confidence as well and then telling the story. So, you know, if you can point to when did a good plan, and a good planning decision may have been to reject an application, but when did a good planning decision enhance um, the environment, a community or the economy and, and getting better at telling those stories? Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Mr Donnelly, do you have anything you want to add at this point? No, it's Mr. Not Mr. Stevenson from the department, do you have anything? Um, I suppose, Chair, from a, a DOF perspective, if we could just make a brief comment on um, governance and accountability. I, I noticed earlier, um, I think Ms. Godfrey was responding to a question from Mr. McHugh and, and set out the um, whistleblowing arrangements that exist in the Department for Infrastructure. I think it's worth just reassuring the committee that uh, 
in September last year, the Department of Finance mm -hmm. issued updated conflicts of interest guidance as well, which is important in terms of uh, reminding civil servants about standards of conduct and uh, the staff handbook, the code of ethics, uh, and also the fact that it's a disciplinary offence um, for, for a range of, of actions in, in terms of abuse of position or misuse of information. So I think it's important just to reassure the committee that our, our guidance in this area is, is up to date and uh, we believe it's fit for purpose. So I, I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you very much for that contribution. So um, after around two hours... I, uh, I knew um, it wouldn't be 45 minutes to turn <laughs> the I, I don't know who told you that. Um, but um, can I just thank... Um, the Permanent Secretary, Trina Godfrey, uh, Julie Thompson, and Angus Kerr, Chief Planner, for your attendance here today. And thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the weekend when it comes. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, members. Hey, members. Um, we are going to take a short adjournment now because the room has to be um, rearranged for Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Kane, and so on. So we'll take a short adjournment. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.